please help me welcome Mark Brown, CSP. <laughs> Beautiful. You are smart. <laughs> you and your team are smart because you <laughs> took advice from the old movie Field of Dreams. If you feed them, they will come. <laughs> My first word of advice for you is this. Stop giving speeches. I love the little what? Yes, yeah, stop giving speeches. You're pros, right? You want to be a pro? Stop giving speeches. Because pros don't give speeches. Pros give experiences. Don't give a speech. Give an experience. I've been blessed over the last 20 plus years to, to meet some great presenters and learn some cool things. So what I share today is not Mark Brown saying, I'm good at this. It's Mark Brown saying, I was a sponge and I learned some things and I enjoy sharing them. Is that OK with you? Yes. I'm also not a, not, a, not a lecturer, I'm not a present, uh, professor, I'm not one of those guys who stands and gives you, even though education runs five generations deep in my family, I want to have fun today. Is that okay? Yes. Do I have permission to have some fun? Yes. I like the interaction. Okay, cool. And it's funny, very early in my speaking career, I was told, Mark, if you're going to get the audience first, you've got to be very clear in your very first few words. By show of hands, were you taught have a really kicking opening, yes or no? Yes. And what advice did you get about the opening? Your opening should accomplish one particular thing, right? Do what? Captivate, Captivate and get there? Attention. Yes! That's only half the truth, though. It's only half the truth. The other half is this. You want to get their attention, but you want to make a connection. And how you do that depends on what you do on the platform. Now, I will, I will say this. I was asked when I was first approached about this, Mark, could you share your expertise on platform skills? I said, why, certainly, I'd like to do that. Mm -hmm. And I found out this morning there are individuals in the room today who were at Influence in July in Denver mm -hmm. who attended my 90-minute deep dive with my partner, Darren LaCroix, on this very subject. And amazingly, <laughs> they're, they're back. <laughs> But, you know, I, I would like to ask you to do one thing very quickly. Because as a presenter, having gone through both a Toastmasters program and being an NSA, I realize that Toastmasters is really, really great at teaching you the art and skill of public speaking. I attend several different chapter meetings, and very often academy members are taught how to really get the script right and build your material, and they focus well on delivering value for your audience. Nothing wrong with that. Don't we all agree we've got to give our audience value? But I have learned, uh, for some reason, and by the way, if you can't handle a Jamaican accent, just kind of tweak your ears a little bit, it'll work out for you. I'm Jamaican, but you can't tell. <laughs> yeah, man, no problem, man, all right. I'm gonna ask you not to have a divorce. Say, what? When I say have a divorce, is this. I've met so many people who they think in terms of, I'm gonna get my content, I'm gonna work on my platform skills. Don't think of them as two different things. They are parts of the whole. It's part of not just what you present, but who you present. It's who you are. And I meet so many people, they want to learn a script. I have clients, I coach speakers, as you probably heard in my intro, and I have clients who work really hard to memorize a 45-minute keynote. If that's your thing, I wish you blessings. But they get so focused on the material, the words, the imagery, it has to fit right. And you forget it's not just about what you say, it's who you are. Mm -hmm. And if you give the audience an experience, it comes first of all from just being conversational. I'm not saying have a conversation, but I find people are relaxed. And, <laughs> and I, I, growing up in Toastmasters, I don't knock Toastmasters. I'm still a card-carrying, dues-paying member after 20, <laughs> six years of Toastmasters, okay? But I was asked to present at an event in Sri Lanka back in 2010, and something happened that really got my attention. They had 500 people in an auditorium at a local university, and the program was marked around in Sri Lanka, which is kind of cool. Had a wonderful time, and it was over, handshakes, questions, business cards, smile, selfies, you know. <laughs> and one individual, a Toastmaster, approached me and said, Mark, you did something wrong today. What did I do? You had your hand in your pocket. Mm -hmm. 
God forbid my hand was in my pocket because I was not the polished speaker. The problem was we need to be relaxed and not rehearsed. And we, we work so hard on our material that we say, I've got to get it right. And people think, oh man, you know, it, it. no, no. I say be personal and not perfect. I learned this over 20 years ago from Morgan MacArthur, who made, whose name may mean nothing to you. Morgan MacArthur is a 1994 world champion of public speaking. He defeated me in the final in 94, and he deservedly won that contest. But he told me the night before the final, it was a Saturday morning final, and on Friday night, some friends say, hey Morgan, we're gonna have a drink, gonna come join us? He said, no, I'm gonna pass. Come on, you're a fun guy, you always have fun. Why are you gonna come with us tonight? What's the, what's the big deal, Morgan? And Morgan <laughs> said, I've got to go work on my contest speech. Morgan, the contest is tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. You can't make any more changes now. You should be locked and loaded. What are you, you going to do, man? And Morgan said, I need to go take some of the polish off. I need to go take some of the polish off. And many of us try so hard to be perfect but the audience wants us to be personal because I believe as much as your audience wants to hear you, they really want to know you. As much as your audience wants to hear you, they really, they really, really, really want to know you. So I wanna ask you all to not give speeches, but to begin to give experiences. And I'm going to break a cardinal rule in presenting, especially with PowerPoint. I'm gonna skip ahead because my heart says, I don't wanna to get too technical, but I wanna get some conversation going here. So I wanna ask you this. How do we establish a relationship with our audience? How do, we, how do we engage them? How do we interact with them? How do we get to participate? Now, I cheat because I'm gonna get you to get involved today too, and my hand is in my pocket right now because I'm really relaxed like this, so it's all good. That way you don't see me doing this. <laughs> Even though I'm right-handed, it's okay. <laughs> when, you have, when you have an opportunity to really connect with the audience, don't think of my opening just to get their attention, but to make a connection, and you can, in so many different ways, you can have a conversation through a question, or through a Q&A, through a hand raise, to get the audience involved. And I like to get my audience to respond by nodding, by show of hands. In my first three minutes, I had you raising your hands. And do you realize that you, if you want your audience to raise your hands, you can almost lead them down that path with the subtle power of suggestion? Many of us know that, many of us may not. The power of suggestion comes by asking questions. Have you ever, I mean, have you ever been in a place where you, you really want to get the audience involved and you're not sure what to do and you, you try to find different ways of doing it? Can you relate to that? Can anybody, can anybody, can you relate? Yeah, right? Now, I just did that. <laughs> you've, you've been, you, felt, you felt something before. You asked the audience, do you know how that feels? Have you been there? By show of hands, have you ever used that technique? Mm -hmm. Many of you, right? And the thing is, I just did that. I use all of these just now, right? I raise my hand first, look around, and what do you all do? I ask these questions. Have you felt that? Have you been there? Have you done that? You go, yeah, you know, you raise your hands. And I raise my hand first, and the first time I said, can you relate, nobody's hand went up. What did I do? Who's been there, right? And, and I nod, and I raise my hand, and for so some reason, we can be like lemmings, <laughs> But you raise your hand first, you look around the room, not as you go, what happens, without knowing it, they're going, yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's true. If they've done it before, they're gonna agree with you. And without knowing it subtly enough, you're using the platform as a place to establish a relationship without having really said very much. But just getting the audience to agree with you on something gives them the buy-in to say, hey, but wait, there's more. <laughs> I'm gonna tune in. I'm gonna lean in. And even now, people are still going, yeah, that's right, Mark. Thank you very much. <laughs> so the first thing is you wanna make sure one of the great powers of the platform is the ability early on to establish that connection, to begin to build a relationship. Now we're taught, know your audience. Doesn't mean you must stalk everybody's Facebook page and find out who they are, but you understand where their mindsets may be, and any little thing you can say 
that will connect with the audience and establish that relationship can be helpful as you do your presentation. Now, sometimes it'll be a half an hour or 45, or maybe it's three days. And over a three-day period, your audience really wants to get to know you. And what I've been told for so long in my life that one of the keys to get the audience engaged is to tell them great stories. We've all heard that, right? Now, I'm a firm believer in stories, and I'll tell you why. As a kid growing up in Kingston, Jamaica, we had scheduled power outages. I'm not knocking my country. It is what it is. We had water cut off. We had outages. We had one TV station, JBC, Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation, black and white, sign on 5 p.m., sign off midnight. No binge watching anything. Reruns of Batman from 67. Yeah, okay. And when lights are off, we had to do homework by lamp and candlelight. But something else happened. Down the street was Mr. Scott, the neighborhood storyteller. He had kids of our age, but he could get all the kids together on a you know, 5 p.m. in the evening when the sun goes down, no lights coming on, and just tell us stories. And stories were the key that drew us into this amazing world that we could not physically get to, but we could imagine. He'd tell us Brother Nancy's stories, and he'd tell us all these scary stories and funny stories, but the story became the thing that drew us all in. And as presenters, we are all storytellers. Time out, Mark. No, you don't get me. I do highly technical presentations. I don't tell stories, liar. <laughs> the cool thing is, even with the most highly technical presentations, your responsibility for the connection is to humanize the numbers and turn the numbers into people and make a statistic become real. Here's one example. It is completely fabricated, totally fictional, but you'll get the idea. Perhaps you are a safety expert and you want people to be aware of the importance of wearing seatbelts. So you say, recent studies by Bonner Research have proven that in 42% of fatal accidents, the decedent was not wearing a seatbelt. You need to buckle up. You get that, right? Let's rewind. And, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> A recent study by Bonner Research said that in 42% of fatal accidents, the decedent was not wearing a seatbelt. That was Josh. He was 17, a high school junior and a baseball phenom. His arm was amazing, so much so three top-level colleagues were, had come to his high school to watch him play because he was mater college material. And they just won the state championship. And he and two of his buddies got into the car, said, Mom, we're going to get ice cream down the street. And they drove six blocks to the local ice cream parlor. Had a good time. Good kids, good grades, a bright future. And on the way back, Josh's buddy, Phil, was driving. It's only six blocks, right? <laughs> so Josh didn't put his seatbelt on. And a drunk driver came through in a section, T-boned him, the car flipped. Josh was ejected, and he was the only fatality. And they found out Josh had not been wearing his seatbelt. A promising future, gone. A family's life, shattered. Because one good kid didn't wear a seatbelt. You need to buckle up. Who felt something just now? The power of the story makes such a big difference. But here's the other excuse I get. But Mark, I don't get, I don't feel like I find, I got no stories. By a show of hands, have you ever thought to yourself, where in the world do I find good stories? Anybody? Be honest. Come on. Because see, we don't have a great life. We didn't climb Mount Everest backwards, <laughs> uphill. Both ways, barefoot, <laughs> right? Yeah. Now maybe you did. No, I didn't. So, but have you ever thought, I don't have a great story? Yeah. Come on, Mark Brown, you know, I read your bio. You were 18, you had 40 bucks, you came to America, now you're a CSP, a world champion, and you coach. Come on, Mark, I haven't got your story. You don't need to be sensational, you just need to be sincere. 
Your story need not be sensational. It just needs to be sincere. And quickly, I'm going to give you a quick story source today, real quick. Mine's right here. It's called a mobile phone, camera roll, or photo gallery. <laughs> By show of hands, who has photographs on their mobile phone? OK. By show of hands, who has a cover picture on their mobile phone? Pull it out real quick. Pull it out. Go ahead. Pull it out. And what's on your cover? I'll tell you what's on mine. Who's got their dog? Who's got their dog? OK. Who's got their kids or grandkids? A vacation picture. A loved one. OK. Why do you have those photographs on your phone? Because they're important. And chances are, if your photo is important to you, there might be something there important to somebody in your audience. Who's willing to share a photograph with me real quick? And, and, and who's got a photograph in there? What, what do you got right here? Just oh, you got a buttons. Yeah, right here. Wow, that's jazzy. Is that you in a, in, in a cartoon? cartoon? It's a cartoon of you singing? Yes. What's it all about? Singing is the most important thing in my life. Why? Because it brings me the most joy. There's more than that. Singing gives you joy. Do you sing for other people? Yes. Why? Because it brings them joy. Boom! Okay. <laughs> now you take a picture. It's a nice cartoon of her holding a mic. She's singing. But music and singing gives you joy. Through that gift, you bring other people joy. You can use that and ask your audience, in what ways can you bring other people joy? What gifts, talents do you have that you hold for yourself that if you expose to the public, might transform their lives and their world? Who would think a cop would bring a guitar and serenade a guy for being here for the first time? <laughs> Boom! Okay? So it may not be singing that brings you joy, that also brings joy to others. What gift, what talent, what skill do you have? What talent do you have? What ability do you have? What is it inside you that you can then take and use to bless, serve, inspire, and help other people? I receive that by looking at that for three seconds. That's how I think. I think kind of weird. I find messages everywhere. I learn from TV shows, from my kids, from what I see on the street, and also from photographs. For me, my cover photograph is a picture of Andrea and me. Andrea's my wife, my most precious one, on the event of our 30th wedding anniversary when we renewed our vows. That speaks to me of love, a family, of commitment. In a world where I'm hearing about there's a 50% divorce rate, Come April, Andrea and I will celebrate our 38th wedding anniversary. Oh, wow. Thank you. Now, this isn't a brag, okay? It's just a reminder to me of how precious she is to my life. And there's so much more behind this I can't even share. I haven't got time to share it. But I can use a photograph from my, from my gallery, and I can say, ha, ah, how can I use a picture to share my thought with my audience? My buddy, Darren LaCroix, who I think was been here before, I'm not sure, has a line that says, capture what captures you. You take, oh, that's funny, it's interesting. Boom, pick a picture of it. Capture what captures you, bring that to your audience, and when you tell them about it, don't just tell them about it, do what, uh, I think it was uh, Lou Heckler who says, don't tell us, take us. Don't just tell us, take us there. So today I wanna kinda focus on how we can take our audiences to places that, as Mr. Scott took us, my, my buddies and I, my brother, my sister, he took us places with his stories but we can do more. We can also do that with the platform. A reminder, do not divorce your content from your presentation of the content. They're all part of the same picture. It's what the audience sees. It is the experience they have from spending time with you. Please also don't make the mistake other people make. They think you only get an experience when somebody sings and plays a guitar, or they do a Dan Thurman and do a somersault and stand on their hands on the, on the podium, or they have the afterburners when they're in there, you know, gonna be all flashy to give an experience. Guess what? You can be the experience. And your body, your face, your voice, your movement can all enhance what the audience experiences. I was taught very early on, I'll give you a line here, which is very nebulous. It says, move with purpose. What in the world does that mean? Who's heard that before? Move with purpose. Okay, I purposely moved here. <laughs> I planned to do that. 
<laughs> what you're saying is don't be that speaker who's always wondering, wondering, wondering. And people can be so critical, but what happens is then I can't concentrate. Simply put, moving with purpose is the idea of every movement, almost every movement has a reason. For example, I have been blessed to spend time with some really great presenters, wonderful material, but a simple error many of us make is, we want to make a really good point and we have it, you're going to love it. And we make the point, don't be like Josh, please wear your seatbelt, okay? It's a good statement, but what's more effective? Please don't be a statistic, don't be like Josh, please wear a seatbelt, or please don't be a statistic. a statistic, don't be like Josh, please wear a seatbelt. You land a powerful line, just stand. Make eye contact and give yourself the power of the pause. Some people feel like radio announcers. Has anybody here worked in radio? The phrase dead air, what does that mean? It could be built. Yeah, it's awful. What, it what, what is dead air? It means not allowing any space between the way you're doing and what's going on. In radio, you can't have yeah. silence. You can't have dead air. So in radio, something must be going on. For presenters, it's the opposite. Sometimes the pause and the silence is the moment of reflection for your words to sink in. So you do two things. You stand still to deliver your powerful line, and then, after you deliver it, give the audience two beats to absorb it and to ponder it. You begin to see a couple of these. You see head nods, or you see for example, I don't mean to call, no, I'm lying. I do mean to call on him. Um, the gentleman over here in a nice, li li lilac, is that right, lilac? Lilac. Oh. I got it right. I am a guy, I know, black, white, blue, green, yellow, purple. But my wife says, that's lilac, I got a new word. <laughs> and your name, sir, is? Bonelaire. Bonelaire, that's, that's like a French, hey. French, ça oh. passe? Yeah. okay, ah, yaman, okay. <laughs> what you didn't see is, when I said, I want you to stop giving speeches. I paused. I went, have you ever seen a confused dog go, huh? <laughs> you know what I'm huh? I said, stop giving speeches. Baudelaire went, because he's thinking, what's this dude? Is he, is he for real? But I used that two second beat to gauge his reaction because get this in the space between your words, your audience is talking to you. In the space between your words, your audience is talking to you. And they'll let you know if they're leaning in, if they're confused, if they're agreeing. You have to focus not fully on, I must now get my next line out, but how is my audience responding? What experience are they having with me in the room? Is this helpful? I was in NSA Houston last month. And I had a, an individual come up and do a part of her speech. I said, oh, hang on, L, slow down, what's going on? She said, well, I want to get through my story because I want to get to the point of my speech. But you're blowing through your story and you're missing the impact the story can have to set the audience up to receive your speech. Because the concept of dead air was hard for her to handle. But in speaking, the pause is powerful. One of my good friends, Craig Valentine, won the Toastmasters world title in 1999, and he was talking about one of the key things to do in life to really get your act together. And he spoke about silence, a really unique topic. And Craig Valentine ended his speech by saying something like this, paraphrase. He said, if I could leave you with one thing, more than any advice I could give you, more than any story I could tell you, if I could leave you with one thing, I want to leave you with this. and ended his speech. And he left us with silence to reinforce the idea that silence can be good. We think if I'm, if I'm too quiet, nothing's going on. But part of the experience for your audience is allowing them to absorb what you have to say. So use the pause after you deliver the point. So it's a couple of things. It's one, deliver the point from a standing position, standing still, look at the audience, 
pause and allow them to absorb it. You combine all those and the experience for the audience is magnified. I say this from 20 years of experience. It's a small thing, right Ty, small thing, big difference. Is that helpful? Other people say, well, you go to a, if you go to an event, you get a platform, it's like an auditorium and you have a huge stage and you wonder, oh my, that's a big stage. You go to NSA Influence, it's a big stage. Toastmasters, huge stage, huge. And you think, man, I can't waste all this space. Who has ever thought, be honest, who has ever thought that before? Be, be honest today. Only me? I learned you don't need to use every inch of the platform in order to make contact. Sometimes the skill of using a platform well is one, how you turn your body. And two, how you establish what we call holograms or scenes on the platform. Is anyone unfamiliar with the hologram concept? A few of you. The idea is a hologram, not a Mike Rayburn hologram, I haven't got 25 grand for that, but Mike Rayburn, NSA, the hologram, he met himself, yeah, he, he played by himself, I almost said with himself, he played <laughs> along with himself on the guitar. Really amazing, cool guy Mike Rayburn, last year's, uh, our last conference chair. When I say hologram, I mean establish a scene on the platform. Whenever you get to that place on the platform, that's where that scene always takes place. For example, if you talk about somebody who was unwell in hospital and you establish that scene here on the platform, and you go on to talk about something else, you're moving in the story, and you come back and say, we were having such a good time, we're so happy to see our, our, our cousins, it's been five years, we're, we're for a picnic. We got our blankets and our baskets and we went, had a picnic. But right here is a hospital scene. You can't have a picnic on somebody's hospital bed. So in your mind, the idea of hologram is, okay, in my mind, that's where the hospital scene is gonna be. Here is a picnic scene and there's gonna be that scene. I have had coaching clients who would come to me with a sheet of paper 10 by 13, and they have drawn on the, on, the, on the paper, I'm gonna put that scene there, that scene there, that scene there. They have mapped out how they will physically present the program so the platform looks like a scene in the audience's mind that's always gonna be hospital. That's always gonna be picnic. That's always gonna be classroom. It's pretty amazing, it's very simple, but the human mind is very, very interesting too. For example, when you read here in North America, how do we read a book? Do we go up, down, inside out? We read in a certain direction, right? So if we read left to right, as a presenter, if we're gonna go back in time, you wanna establish past to the audience's left. Present, future. So time passes left to right for them as we read a book. It's a real simple concept, but you go, he's doing it already, he's, he's figuring it out, that's amazing. And this is, your name? It's Mike. Mike, Mike, I like Mike. <laughs> he's, you could, he, I wish you could see what I see. I said earlier, watch your audience, they'll talk to you. Mike is in his mind going through one of his talks, I, I guess, or at least the scene, he's going, okay, move here, move here. He's actually doing it in front of me, and I'm saying, he's getting it. He's doing this, he's, he's like in his mind, okay, so my right is really their past. Even though I read left to right, I must flip it and think in the audience's mind, so that's the past, okay, so I must start there and move that way. Mike is doing all that in his head silently and I'm watching him going, yes, he gets it. <laughs> gets it. Like I said, you need not use the whole width of the platform, okay? And it's one mistake I was making for a long time that I just realized the last couple of years, duh, it's this. Using the depth of the platform as well. That's one thing I often see people completely ignore. We need a large area, how can I use a depth as well? As an 18 year old kid in New York for the first time, I was hired as a bank teller. Now back then I hadn't worked on modifying my accent as I have over the last 35 years to make it more neutral. So I had a very heavy Jamaican accent, you know what I mean? And when I talk, they wouldn't always understand me. And I became so 
concerned about it that after a while my confidence fell. I'm a bank teller, I have to deal with the public. And they, I found people would say, what did you say? Now I'm not knocking a New York accent, forget about it, you know, don't even think about it. But, but these New Yorkers and this Jamaican kid, I lost confidence. And I found after a while, when I kept being asked to repeat myself, what do you say, huh, what do you, what do you say? I would say, no, you need to sign the deposit ticket this way. And after a while, my voice began to trail off. And it was as, as if I was just fading away and losing myself because I lacked confidence. You see that? I used the depth of the stage at an angle to show the regression while my voice got softer. So the experience you have is of this poor kid and I also, very closely, you go, watch subtly, I also did this, and I was shrinking back. Little subtle details add the image that the audience sees, and some are saying, oh, that poor kid. You begin to feel something. Who felt something for this kid? Be honest. Of course, but it was a simple technique. Using the depth of the stage, when appropriate, it can also help you to give the audience the emotional connection that they need to understand more deeply what you are saying. And these are basic techniques I learned over time. So the concept comes down to this. Don't just tell the story, but create the scene. Um, by the way, you can always just camera if you want to. This is just text. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give you a high, high, high tech PowerPoint with some great graphics. This is simple nuggets. I'm gonna give some nuggets. What I found is when you create a scene and you can establish on the, on the platform where things happen, it gives the audience subtly a chance to remember what you're saying. And what I find also helpful is that many of us in our stories, in our presentations, we want to give information. We want to give value. It's true. But in Morgan MacArthur's story, I could have told you what Morgan said. I could have told you, he told me about this and he, he told his friends he didn't want to go because he wanted to, he wanted to take the polish off. But in a moment, I actually use Morgan's voice. So examine for yourselves, how often do you use dialogue and how often do you use narration? Do you talk about the characters or do you become the characters? I wanna sit here for a while. Do you talk about the characters or do you become the characters? That's a whole big piece altogether. Uh, I was going to show you a little video clip, but I'm, gonna not, I'm not gonna show it to you, I'm gonna do it for you. Now when I say become the character, what do I mean by that? I mean just that. Maybe your talk is on leadership, and I have done a talk on leadership, well, more than one, <laughs> but I tell the story of, of an experience I had with a leader. And by the way, I know there are plethora of stories out there on leadership. There are, there are great stories of great people and what they've done. I could mention you know, people like Winston Churchill, and that's fine. But for me, personally, when I hear your story, I'm more intrigued. What, 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 is, what is your experience with leadership, good or bad? And by the way, show of hands, who does talk on leadership? Great. It's a quick idea of a story for you. You may have your signature stories, they're all established, but there may be some story you have in your, in your memory bank, it's not really there. I'm gonna offer you a, a concept, and it may show up later on, but I'm going to give it to you right now that has helped me to unearth some really cool stories, not only on leadership, but on life. Here's a, here's a concept. I use what I call best and worst, last and first. So take leader. Who was your best leader? Who was your worst leader? Who was your first leader? Who was your, who was your last leader or boss? So I'll, I'm gonna tell a story. I, I think, okay, I wanna get a bad leader story. Okay, I know who I, I'll, I'll talk about. I'll talk about uh, Steve. So here's a Steve story, right? When I was a young programmer in New York State, I worked for, I was brand new at this company and my boss's name was Steve. And I remember one day Steve came to me with an assignment to, to do a program. And for some reason, Steve chose to give it to me on a paper napkin. Because Steve was kind of a, a, an unkempt kind of guy. He was kind of messy and not very organized. And he gave it to me on his napkin. And I was about to do the work and the guy behind me, who hardly talked to anybody, told me not to do it. For, for a while. I said, what do you mean? He said, not to do it. He said, don't, he told me not to do it because he said, Steve is the kind of guy who gets so confused and so flat flustered, he probably come back in, in three days and tell me not to do it in three days. I'm thinking to myself, I can't, I can't tell Steve was my boss. But because the guy told me not to do it, 
I kind of dabbled in it. And three days later, Steve came by and told me not to do it. It was a mistake. Don't worry. Forget about it. He'll, give, he'll get back to me. And he walked away. And I thought to myself, my gosh, this guy was right. Steve really is a lousy boss. Can you, can you feel that? No? She turned her said, no. Her nose. <laughs> Thank you for being honest. Your name is? Mary, thank you for your honesty. She said no, and she's like, no. A little no, a little not no. Like, I love that. You know why? I agree with her. I will not do the rewind sound again, but, but here's, a, here's, a, here's, here's a story. It's a true story of Steve. I call him Steve because his name is Steve. And I was new at this company, a bank in White Plains, New York, and Steve was a little unkempt guy, disheveled hair, and he waddled. He reminded me of the Penguin in Batman, 1966, played by Burgess Meredith. He waddled. His shirt was untucked, his hair was unkempt, and he kept doing this, to kind of the, you know, the, the overcome thing. And he talked fast with a pretty, pretty thick New York accent. And I was a cubicle dweller. You know those walls with padded walls? It <laughs> felt like a padded wall room with the beige, about yay high. I'm sitting there one morning, it was a Monday morning, about 10.30, and Steve waddled over. Hey, Mark, 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 because in New York, my name is Mark. <laughs> Mark, 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 I got this for you. I, I, I do it real quickly. And Steve gave me an assignment on a paper napkin. Everything was done with structure and a scope statement and a request, but not for Steve, and it was urgent. Mark, got to do it right away. I, okay, get back to me. And he waddled away. I sat there thinking, I've got all the work to do, but Steve says, do this now, okay. I began to type on the keyboard, and I heard, psst, psst, hey, new guy, psst. Behind me sat silent Dave. Dave didn't talk to anybody. I heard his voice, I turned, and I saw this. <laughs> Was that Steve? But yeah, let me guess. He gave me an assignment, right? My dog, my boss, yeah. On a napkin? How do you know that? Because it's Steve. Do yourself a favor. Don't do anything for three days. What are you kidding me? It's my boss. Trust me, I know Steve. Don't do anything for three days. He's going to come back to you and cancel the whole thing. He's done it before. Are you sure? Three days, three days, three days. <laughs> and Dave was gone. Sure enough, three days later, Steve waddled over. Hey, Mark, 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 that thing I gave you Monday? Ah, 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 we're not gonna do it anymore, don't worry about it. Just go back to your work, forget about it, okay? I'll talk to you soon, bye. And Steve was gone. I sat there dumbfounded. And then I heard it. <laughs> I turned and I saw And in that moment, I realized good leaders think before they act. Good leaders make wise choices. Good leaders don't waste three man days. The question is, are you a good leader? Mary, is that better? Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I got her approval. Thank you. So help me out, what, what, just, just, just shoot, shoot at me, what differences did you see in the way I told the story the first time and the second time? Any answers? Of course, yeah. You showed the story. I showed, what do you mean by showed? Ah, okay, so I became the characters. You said the actions, yes. I'm in the office with you. You are in, yeah. thank you. So again, that's giving the audience the experience. He felt, who liked the uh, whole thing with Dave and the cubicle? I mean, there's no wall here, but the, you know, Dave's character and the laugh when, when he smiled nodded his head, right? Could you relate to that? Have you ever, now be honest, who thought of a boss you had? Who maybe not looked like, but I mean, the same behaviors, right? So what else struck you between the two? The two? What was different? Yes. You didn't have to say, then Dave said, then I said, then Dave said, then I said. How, what worked for you? Ah, body the body language told, told a story. So if, by, by I turn like this, you know it's me looking up at Dave, and that's him looking down at me. I'm still here. I didn't go anywhere, because the th thing is this. Sometimes you will find yourself with an assignment where you're doing a, a breakfast, 
a lunch or a dinner event, you're doing a meal event by show of hands. Have you had an event where you had a lectern, the box is here, table there, table there, you can hardly even move, anybody? Luncheons, banquets, and you want to tell a really cool story and you can't move. You don't have to do back and forth. What do you do? What you do is, well, I'll answer in a second. Anybody else before I answer the question? Yes? Yeah, I get in front of the, the podium. Well, you can. And sometimes I've been in those rooms where you have, you have just the, the raised platform, long table, podium, and there's no room to walk. You're stuck behind a box. I had a keynote for a, a, a group in Maryland, Annapolis, last month in October. I could not leave that box. But I had to establish I, uh, characters and they could see people. So you gotta see the characters. Anything else came to anybody's mind between the first and second way of the Steve story? Yes? I, you had a name for the guy, Silent Dave. And everybody ah. has names for their coworkers. Ah, right. The name Silent Dave is more memorable than just Dave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the name Silent Dave. You give your characters names that are also characteristic, char characteristics, like Officer Friendly. Mm -hmm. That means something to you, okay? Or Madam Miserable. <laughs> and please, no one talk about your mother-in-law, okay? Don't do that. <laughs> That's a bad joke. My mother-in-law is wonderful. But if we put a name and a character together, the audience finds that more memorable. So Silent Day, that's good. And I was able to establish a visual. I said, I was a cubicle dweller. What does that do for you as an audience? When I say I was a cubicle dweller, what do you think? Can you see, can you see that? Who has spent time in a cubicle at work before? Right? You know what it feels like. So you try to establish through your words and visuals, your verbal visuals, something the audience can physically relate to. So if I say cubicle dweller, anybody who has been there says, yep, I know what that is like. So always think, what can I say so the audience can relate and get a visual in their minds? And if possible, and I'm not a gambling person, but I'm told that your gamblers, some gamblers do really, really well because they learn to read their opponent. Because their opponent has what they call a tell. What's a tell? Who's, who's a gambler here who can tell me what a tell is? Who can tell me what a tell is? Tell me tell, tell, tell. Do tell. Yes? You give, you're giving it away. There's something in their face. Right. There's something, a change, a change. So, especially when you can't move, mm -hmm. establish tells to identify characters. For example, hey, Mark, 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 who's that? Steve. Steve. Hey, new guy, who's that? Steve. Just a change in the voice. Sometimes you are stuck at a lecture and you want to do two people, it could be a father and his son. And sometimes all you need to do to establish that difference is one, a change in vocal pitch. Here's my father's voice, here's a son's voice. Father's voice, son's voice. Son, I'm sorry, I gotta go. But dad, I don't wanna be with you. I know I'm coming back tomorrow, son. What else did I do just now? Father looks down, son looks up. A simple little thing. And you, if you can also just adjust your body if you want to establish looking over there or looking over there. You, how you adjust your body in most minuscule ways can be so powerful and the audience can see a different character. I have seen people on stage deliver this so well, I thought I was with them for the whole time. I saw an established comic one day do a two hour program sitting on a chair with a table of a vast of flowers and he sat there and told stories for two hours and I was, I was with him in his car, in his living room. I was with him in Nelson Mandela's living room, uh, office. I mean, it was, he took us, like I said, you were there in the office today. Little things you can do. And you can establish characters by the vocal pitch, by how fast they speak. You could even use slight accents like, hey, Mark. And I'm not a New Yorker, but I can say, forget about it, right? Like, you don't forget about it, you're talking to me, get out of here. <laughs> Took me a while to learn that. <laughs> so I want you to think for a moment about some of these things. Let's gonna go back, okay? I, I, I know I can't believe the first 45 is gone already, but I, I want you to think about it for a second. What can you do differently going forward to establish one holograms on stage? Think of your stories you tell. Think of the facts you wanna, you wanna leave with your audience. Think of when your story goes through a passage of time. Can you use the stage to have the audience see time passing? Can you pause longer to give them a chance to really absorb what you have to say? We're gonna take a break. I wanna go a little more deeply 
into some little cool techniques on the platform. I'm going to go a little deeper in this, but I also would like, before we end today, this, this, or late this morning, to find out who my brave volunteers are besides Samantha, who's going to come and um, give a part of the speech. So we can look at some of the things you've learned today. Tell me what you want to do differently. Tell me why you want to do it differently. And I really wanted to spend a little time with you being bold and brave enough amongst your peers to just share a piece of what you have to say and let me work with you on that. Is that cool? Say yes. 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 Do you realize that when you're here, you have great power over the audience? I'm saying say yes, you're saying yes, even if you don't want to, some of you. <laughs> but the good news is, for me, you want to. So if you have had some photographs, snapshots, great. Also, do, this for me, do me a favor, in the break, last thought is this. I'd like you to look at your camera roll and take a, identify one photograph, one photograph that you think might be the basis of a new story you could add to your speech. Now, I share all this with you. I'm going to ask you one last question before the break. Has there been some value to you for this yes. so far? Yes. Okay. You will also notice that I not only speak, I spend a lot of my time coaching individuals, and I've also begun doing a podcast with Darren LaCroix, fellow CSP world champion. It's called Unforgettable Presentations Podcast. And all we do, it doesn't cost you anything to, 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 to listen and subscribe, all we do is focus on presenters. We give high content and technique. We also interview well-known speakers who have, who have delivered amazing uh, uh, presentations. And we, we, we do the podcast weekly. On your table is a card about the podcast. Real simple. Tune in Apple, Spotify, with the Google Play. Check us out. We have put, already posted 14. We actually began the podcast at the end of August. Check us out. Also, if the idea of coaching interests any of you, I'm going to ask, if you don't mind, just, just to give me your contact info right here. I ask only one thing. I have a newsletter. It's free. It's going to cost you anything. Write your name, legibly, and your email, legibly. You'll get my newsletter. You'll see new videos posted pretty much once a week on my website. And I want to share with you what I have. If anyone has any interest in coaching, you can see me. I'm, I'm officially not supposed to sell anything, but if you really think you could use some help, I do this a lot, and I'd love to work with you. We can get details shared. I want to return control of the speaking area to Liz. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you so much. Has the value been fairly good for you so far today? Good. Now, there's something I didn't talk about in the first part of our program because time went by and I left my clicker over here. And it is this. Let's see, open this up. It's not a blank screen. That blank screen. Have you ever noticed that when you do PowerPoint, there are times you want to stop the screen and keep talking, but you don't know what to do? Who has had that problem before? You all know what to do, right? Hit the B button for the blank. But on my clicker, I forget what B was on my clicker. I haven't used it in a long time, so I don't want to start pushing all the buttons. So you hit B, go blank. Now, I, I don't know if this is going to work or not, but W goes to white screen. Why would you want to do white screen? Unless you want to go. <laughs> I, uh, so <laughs> I'll unwhite the screen. I didn't talk about props in the first part of our program. And by the way, show of hands. Did you find a photograph that might be helpful for one of your speeches? Show of hands, anybody? Three and a half people. That's great. Whoa, OK. <laughs> the numbers aren't so great here, Liz. I don't know what's going on here. OK. Now, props. Does anyone here use props yes. by show of hands? Yes. What do you use, Liz? I use a, I use a hammer. A hammer. A sledgehammer. Uh, yes. And a shield. And you wear gloves? No gloves. But you wear a shield for your face. A shield, a face. Are, are you Gallagher's sister? Gall no. Gallagher? No. Gallagher? No. Bueller? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Yeah. Who does not know who Gallagher, does not know who Gallagher is? Who does not know who Gallagher is? You don't know who Gallagher is? The guy with the watermelons and a sledgehammer. Oh. <laughs> and you got to wear a plastic in the front row. He's going to hit with watermelon pieces. So you use not watermelons. What do you, what do you hit? Cinder blocks? I don't get anything. I just, I just do the, the symbol of my communication style. So you're, you're going gangbusters. <laughs> you know what? I'm very impressed. In 25 years, I've never met anyone who says, my style is, I'm a sledgehammer. So that's, a, that's pretty cool. I saw a hand here from what else? What do you use? Rotten apples. You don't eat them, do you? No. Oh, where do you find them? You grow them and just let them lie for a while? Or? No, I, I smash them, then I put them in the 
the night before at home or in the hotel room, put them in a plastic bag to show oh. how bad that attitudes impact the whole. Yeah. One bad apple won't spoil the whole bunch. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, that was bad. <laughs> Not as cool as Tim, obviously. Who else has props? Yes. A clock. Pull it out in front and say tick tock, tick tock, 86,400 seconds, that's all you've got. Oh, nice. A clock. As long as nobody thinks that's my body clock, I would. Okay, never mind. Yes. <laughs> I use an expandable, colorful breathing ball. Oh. To show that we have all these good methods to help children learn how to breathe deeply, but we oh. have really challenging behaviors. What they're often going to do with that ball is grab it and throw it at you. Oh. <laughs> Got a dog then. <laughs> but you said good prop. Anybody else? Two more. Two more. Yes. Here's a lamp for my son's bedroom. A, like a lava lamp? Or no, 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 no. A, a lamp. About the results that we get are the light that shines off the lamp. And how do we get better results? Change the light bulb, which is learning. Ah, the bing. And that was a nice image. One more. Anybody? Anyone? Any, no, no? Okay. Do you know in the Toastmasters world, they have this annual contest and of course 35,000 people enter this contest with the goal of becoming the next world champion, right? And the, over the last 25 years, I've seen so many contests at so many levels because the contest is six levels from club all the way to world championship. And the most commonly used prop in a Toastmasters contest, you know what that is? Up until they banned it two years ago? A chair. And I spent a lot of years doing junior high and senior high school programs, and I had three props. I had, in the previous iteration, a VCR remote control unit to do my rewind sound. But that doesn't work anymore, because kids go, what's that? Because they got DVD, next chapter, you know, now it's all high tech, you're on your phone, skip, skip, skip. Back in the day, I had a v, I actually had VHS in my program, but that's now passe. I also use a chair in different ways, and I use two other props. I use a pocket handkerchief and some pocket tissues. So the question becomes, how, what kind of props should you use, okay? The key witness statement is this. Use props as necessary to support the message, not overtake it. Bad font, there should be a one line. Not overtake it. Do you realize your props or anything you use can actually upstage your message? A great story can upstage your message. A point on experience can upstage the message. And some people use props in some ways that they don't realize aren't as effective as they do, as they think they will be. For example, some props come out later in our presentation, towards the end or towards the middle. Does anybody have props right away? Or anybody has a prop come out later in the, in the talk? Like my chair is always there, but it's, it's not front and center. My chair is behind me, depth of the stage, so I'm here, they see me, they don't sit in a chair till I need it. Some props come out later in the talk, but if your prop is front and center stage and you don't use it for a half an hour, what's going on in the audience's mind? What's with the chair? I've seen people have a suitcase as in on the stage. And it means something, but it's sitting there for, for 25 minutes and we're all wondering, What's with the suitcase? How quick does he have to leave? <laughs> that could be, it was, well, I gotta go anyway, but so you, you, you wonder about these things and you have to ask yourself, is it the best way to use the resource? So a prop shouldn't overtake. People ask, well, how, prop, how big should a prop be? How big should a prop be? Anybody? Anyone? The, not, no trick question here, just asking you, what do you think? Big enough for the audience to see it. As big as it needs to be. I love this answer. As large or as small as it takes to be effective. And be effective is the key. Is it supporting your message or is it overtaking it? Is it because you like to use it, but is it really effective? Is it the best tool to use? Do you even need it? I've seen a CEO of a large company use a mint as a prop. The scenario was he had come in late for a corporate meeting from New York into Dallas, Texas. Fairmont Hotel, Dallas, Texas. And there was a delay in his flight. He got in early that night, and the restaurant was closed. He was tired, and he wanted to eat something. He was going to wait for room service at 2 in the morning. I had to speak in the morning. And he said, the thing I had to eat last night was one of these. And he held up the mint from the pillow in his hotel room the night before. Now, in many cases at a conference, you get a main stage, main stage presentation. You're on iMag behind you. 
and you get the two large screens behind you, you let the videographer know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention this particular prop, zoom in on the prop when I get there. And they'll, the idea of this minuscule mint for a guy who's six foot one, 250, for supper at night before, who's our corporate CEO, all of a sudden the context becomes like, that's all he got? Wow, and he came for us? And he began to think, about his commitment to the company. But you also see he was creative in the moment he found a tool he could use in the moment to be effective. So the sidebar is this. While you may have established a prop you use in your presentation, don't be close to the idea that you may find something in the moment on the flyer can be helpful to you. Like today, I didn't plan to say if you feed them they will come, but it occurred to me this is a meal event. I'll just say that, and you all laughed. And immediately, you kinda you can got to like me a little bit, at, sort of, at the front. But here's the thinking. Always be aware of what's around you. What can I use from around me that can be effective to give the audience an experience? And sometimes we don't call them props, we call them visual aids, like slides and photographs. I, I mentioned that earlier. A photograph can be a really cool tool to help with a message, okay? I said earlier that when you use your body, when you use your voice, when you, when you change the way you speak, they're effective tools. And I saw one of the most amazing props I saw was in a movie. But it's like, it's unbelievable. You all remember uh, this guy named Christopher Reeve? Yeah. The late Christopher Reeve, grace his soul. He played the role of Superman. Super Fellow, right. And he was well known for that. I always ask the question, how can Clark Kent, how can he hide behind a pair of glasses? There's a curl in his forehead, his hair. It's the same guy. How could they not know until I watched Superman? I think it was Superman 3. It's a scene where Clark Kent is going to take Lois Lane out for a date. Margot Kidder and Christopher Reeve are in the scene together. You can Google it, where Christopher Reeve becomes transformed into Superman. And all he did was remove his glasses and change his body. And I, I may have... I don't think the video is in here, no. But what he did is this. He wants to tell her that he's, that I'm, really, I'm really Superman. And he says, oh, Lois, I gotta tell you something. And he, she goes to the bedroom. He puts his glasses, he takes them off. And then he does this. Lois, I wanna tell you something. And then he, his mind changes. And he puts them back on, lowers his shoulders. Oh, Lois, we could, we could go and have a burger somewhere. And all he did was change his body from here to here and put the glasses, take the glasses off. And he looked different. And that one little prop was helpful to change him from one person to another. I've seen our speakers do the same thing. Put glasses on, pull them down, and they become a nerdy professor because they chose to do that particular thing. But every little prop can help you to become a different person if used effectively. Now a large prop, like a chair, I've seen people use a ladder on stage as a prop. A ladder. Morgan McCarthy, who won the world title in 94, used a life-size collapsible horse in a speech contest in 1993. A life-size collapsible horse on stage to show the horse Jasmine, who was injured at birth and grew up to be a big, strong horse, to tell us we've all got horsepower but as big or as small as it needs to be. In my youth program, I tell the kids, I go to schools and I carry my tools. What are my tools? I say I have two things. I have a white handkerchief, which is back in my back pocket. I have a white handkerchief. You know why? The lights are hot. It's great for this. It's awesome for this. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and they laugh. But see, I, I, don't want, I don't want to stay laughing. I say, well, I also carry this. I carry a packet. Pocket tissues. I'll tell you why. I carry these to dry the eyes of kids like you who stop me in the hallway, who tell me their stories, and who cry on my shoulder because of how they're treated. Now, I'm no psychologist, psychotherapist, psychoanalyst. I'm no psycho. <laughs> I'm just a guy who talks to kids like you, a stranger. But they feel nobody else cares, and they come to me, and that's why I carry these. And the, laughter is, the laughter was good, but it's gone now because now they realize that kids are really crying over this. I use a packet of pocket tissues. 
The hanky was to make him laugh. The, the twist was to take these out and tell him why I do it. And it's a very effective prop because it, it's true. Kids do come to me in the hallway after a youth program and say, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of this. I, wa I want to stop. I, I, I don't want to come back to school anymore. And when I share these stories, the prop, the visual of kids crying their eyes out, and I'm the one drying their tears, powerful. A simple packet of pocket tissues. So think of the impact your prop can have. I like the metaphor with the light. I like, I like everything so far. I can't get over the sledgehammer. But, <laughs> but think of what might you have at your disposal that might be a strong visual that you can use to reinforce the message and again make the experience that much more real for the people in your audiences. And I know with those who do technical presentations, there are times you will have to give the graphics and give the numbers and show the chart because some people have, their learning is very linear, they're very numbers oriented, that's fine. We all learn in different ways. So the, the trick is, what can I put, how can I craft my presentation so every learning style or pretty much every learning style has something they can work with. Some of us can be very tactile, they have, you know, you have hand things or they touch things. Somebody get up, they touch each, talk to each other, they say high five, they shake hands. Some people, I don't want to talk, touch anybody. Just give me information, I'm going to take it. Others, oh, I love a good story. I didn't hear any stories. I didn't feel anything. And they want to feel something. So part of my responsibility is to give the numbers, tell the stories, give options for, for interaction with the audience, but to, in whatever way is possible to give them the experience. My chair in my speech becomes me and my kids watching a cartoon on TV one day. It also ends up in a very, very poignant way to represent, because I talk, I talk to kids about relationships, how they talk to each other, the power of words, verbal weapons, and a strong anti-bullying component. And I tell them that in 19, you know, 2010, our worst year for teen suicide, over 32 kids took their own lives because they were bullied at school. And I show a list of names and their ages. I say, look at these numbers. One third of those kids, it happened before, it happened before November which means for one third of those kids, they didn't make it through the first semester of school. And we can say sticks and stones all we want. I was kidding all we want, but you know what? I can't tell that to a mom or a dad who tonight will sit down for supper and they're gonna stare across their dining table at an empty chair because someone thought it was funny to call a kid stupid, to pick on a fat kid, to call some kid a loser. And they weren't kidding. So now the chair I was with my kids sitting on, it was transformed into a, a, an empty chair, a life that's lost, and the kids are going, whoa. So think about different ways you can use your prop for fun, for poignancy, but always for one purpose, to get back to your core message. It must always support the message. And I know sometimes a prop looks nice, it becomes me, and it's your signature, that's great, don't stop using it. But ask yourself, is this the most effective way and what can I tweak to make it different? I found out a VCR remote control was no longer effective because kids don't watch VCR video anymore. You okay, sir? <laughs> you got me with that story. <laughs> wow. No, 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 think about this for a second. I'm telling you a story about what I talk about, but she was moved by it. And I wasn't trying to touch, pull on your heart. I'm just telling you what I do. But that, was, that, that tells me it was effective, even for an adult audience, I've done doing it for years. So what I'm saying is you have no idea how great your impact can be when done well. That's why I always say having the power of the platform is so, it's so meaningful because you have a chance to literally touch and change and move people in such powerful ways. And I, I get so, I feel so honored to spend this time talking about this with you because I believe if we can be professional in the way we use our bodies, use our state, use our tools, we can not only deliver the message, we can, we can be impactful with our message. Because you know what? It's nice to hear how good you are on stage. It's nice standing up, oh, that's a great speaker. But if you ask, the, ask them three days, three weeks, three months later what they said and they can't tell you, it's a problem. Now I don't say this as a brag. Please do not misunderstand me. But learning these skills I became an NSA member more than 20 years ago. I got a 20 year pin right here. I joined Toast Masters in 93, won the world title in 95, became NSA in 98, and I've been working at this for a long time. So I've been giving these talks to young people and adults for over 20 
two years, okay? And once in a while, you know the impact you get when somebody comes back and tells you. Maybe five weeks or five months or five years later. By show of hands, have you had that experience? What does that feel like? Oh. And they remember, Mark, you said this and you did. I remember the story. Oh, you did Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, I began doing a Beauty and the Beast speech in 1994, and I still get asked to do it today, 25 years later. And once in a while, I'll get something in the mail that tells me I'm doing okay. I was trying to clean my briefcase out this week, and I found something that I think I want to share with you real quick. I have a scrappy, scrappy old piece of paper. It's getting all ripped and torn. And, uh, <laughs> Subject, thanks for coming to my school. Excerpt, hi, my name is Raquel. You came to my school about seven years ago and gave your words count speech, power of words. And I want you to know I've never forgotten it. To this day, I still use your analogy as part of my life, sharing it with the kids I work with and to jerks I see being rude to someone else. And because of your speech, I'd like to think I'm a better person. I know you don't know me or even my school, but that's okay. But I wanted to say thanks. Thanks so much. Seven years. The other one also wrinkled was um, from Megan. Hi, Mr. Brown, my name is Megan, a senior, University of Maine. I am writing to you today to thank you for words you shared with my class back in 2002 when I was in eighth grade. It's been almost a decade since you spoke to my friends and me, but I always remembered your name. And I'm sure you hear it a lot, but you changed my life. So thank you, Mr. Brown. You know that for a few ragtag kids for whom adulthood was a distant dream, you made one hell of a difference. I keep these, and I should just like, laminate them, right? But I'm just a boring guy. I just kept this in my bag. I, I forgot I kept it in that particular pouch. But they tell me I still remember what you said and what you did. And while your words can be remembered, remember you. The images you presented, the, the props you used, they say, yeah, you did the beauty and the beast. I sing a part of beauty and the beast in my speech. And they remember that because that was what I did on a platform and created an indelible image in their, in their minds. And I want to believe in their hearts. And one of the young people, her name is uh, Molly. Molly I met in 1998. And back in October, she and I exchanged WhatsApp messages. It was her birthday. I said, well, you know, 33, now I'm 34. It's been 21 years since you came to my school, and she still writes me. That's where my heart goes, thank you, God. It's like, you know, and all that came from me using what I had. A chair, a pocket of tissues, a handkerchief. I sang a song of Beauty and the Beast, and I touched some kid's heart, and at 34 years old, she still reaches out to me. This is not a brag. This is an aha moment for me. What impact can we have if we use the platform responsibly and wisely? Not to show the world how good we are, but to show them how good they can be. That's what we have. We have an opportunity. We have a responsibility. So think about every tool you have, how you use your body, how you use those spaces, how you, how you, you, how you open, how you connect immediately, how you establish that relationship. What experience can you give tomorrow that you didn't give yesterday? And I can't track you. I can't monitor you. I can't give you homework and say you didn't do this, hold you accountable. I'm, I'm pleading with you to double down on your sense of responsibility. I say double down because I believe you already are responsible or you wouldn't be here today. But I'm saying, what more can I do? Who else can I touch? How can I make their lives better by this, with this wonderful opportunity? And that being said, I'd love to give some of you an opportunity to let us see what you do every single day. I don't want to pick on people, even though I already called one person by name who's getting all ready to put her lipstick on so she can come on stage. <laughs> by the way, by the way, sidebar, I'm a word nerd, which can often get me in trouble. And I was saying to myself, there's Samantha back there, she's farting. F-A-R-D-I-N-G. What does that word mean? F-A-R-D-I-N-G. Good, look it up in the dictionary. Supply makeup. It means supply makeup. 
But Americans talk funny. You turn a T into a D, that word gets lost. <laughs> that word gets, gets lost in the translation, okay? I digress, but I only said that to prove, it's gonna be a really weird video, Liz, uh, when, you, when you look at it. I said to prove that, you know, how my brain works. I'm always trying to find ways to be creative. I'm trying to find ways, how can I make it look, look more appealing so I can really get into their hearts. I want to make that connection. So I'm gonna ask again, who's brave enough to spend two minutes and give us a piece of their speech, an opening, a story, and let us kind of see how you apply what you've learned so far. Oh, we're gonna first volunteer. Is Kathy with the eye, right? Yes. All right, Kathy, thank you. And what part of your talk will you share with us today, Kathy? I will share my opening. Your opening, y'all ready for this? Now guess what? Right now, you're all coaches. Okay, you're all coaches now, and you're gonna observe what Kathy has to say, and you'll have ideas to share, not just you didn't do this or you didn't do that. Coaching is, here's how to make it better, and encourage her what she has done well. Make sense? Yeah. All right, go Kathy. So applause. Pause. Okay, it's okay, pause. It's for everyone. This is not a bad thing, but it happens every time. You get the applause. Now sometimes you might find yourself giving a talk after somebody else, after the president's remarks or after some previous speaker. Yes? yes. I have a conference on, Saturday, on Sunday in Chicago when they sent me the, the, the minute by minute, the actual script, word for word before I get introduced. What happens is the audience applauds. And you begin speaking. No. Pause. It's okay to have dead ear. Why? You want them to get the applause done, the, the phones are down, the, bu the books are up, you want them focused on you. So my buddy Ed Tate, CSP from Denver, now in Vegas, he does what we call the Ed Tate stare. So you applaud, Mark Brown, I come up, and I look for a second, then I speak. Because they haven't quite done this yet. You don't want to, to speak over the applause. You want to wait till the applause is down. And if you wait even a little bit longer, you might want to make sure by eye contact. Because Ed does a quick scan, right, left, middle. He knows all eyes on me. Not for ego purposes, but to be in a place where they're really ready to receive what he has to say. So, Kathy! Pause. <laughs> Just tell the story. Would you agree? Yes. Just tell the story. I call this, I call this the movie opening. The movie opens. <laughs> Cars on the corner. <laughs> we want to know what's going on. But we're not paying a scene for you with a car chase. No. Into the scene. So one more time, Kathy. And okay. Good. attention for Taylor. He was wanting attention. I called my previous two fire departments. They didn't know what to do about him. My current department didn't know what to do about him. So I taught him about consequences, about fire science, about how fire really works. I recommended some counseling for the family. And today, my son Taylor is 
29 years old. He is not a pyromaniac, as most people think when I tell them about the work I do. Kids start fires for reasons. With intervention, less than 3% continue to start fires. Without intervention, the latest studies show out of Philadelphia, 63% of kids who start fires will continue without intervention. Pause for a second. Which is good information, right? Good observations, anybody? Observations, your coaches, yes. I would wait until a little later in your speech to disclose that that was your son. Keep me hanging. Till the very end, okay? I'm sorry, yeah. And sometimes you can move things around. Okay, that's one good, one good thought, yes? Was there yes, a hand here? No? Anybody else? Yes. I like your commanding presence that's also um, gentle. Interesting, yes. Mike. I think her subject matter is so needy yeah. that she could be a bad speaker and have a great impact. <laughs> he said, could be, Kathy. He didn't say are. Okay. One or two, yes. Okay, good. Becoming the character. Okay, one more thing. When she's talking, she's talking with the year. In the year 1995, Okay. I like the sound in the, the, you can picture the sock going into the light. Picture right. And the smell of the smoke. Yes. Right. Okay. A couple of things. Yes, two more. I like One, two. That, I like that she made a connection early on by being vulnerable, revealing that it was her son. Okay. That, that's that's going to be, that's going to stay. That's going to stay. No doubt. It's going to stay. Yes. I Bill. I was drawn into the story uh, of uh, the light fixture and the fire, but then I didn't get an ending. Well, yeah, I, I kind of cut her off, I know, but he, and he's saying you want to end a little more quickly and what's resolved. A couple of things, first of all, what could, I think would help. I didn't go into detail for a reason. I want this to come out later. Do you know that your face and your body needs to be congruent with your subject matter? Yes. Now, what kind of emotion would a mom feel when she finds her house is burning down? You are so calm. Mom asked the kids, <laughs> No, mom wanted to know what was going on, so we had the kids come out and we got hold of the fire department and told them, okay? Now you are in your house. With, how old is Taylor, five years old? Yeah. With a five-year-old kid, you smell smoke and you think your house is burning down. How do you react? Come on, kids, you will be calm in a fire. Yeah, probably, you're thinking that. I'm thinking, let's go, kids, out of here. So when you become the character, so go back. The year was 95, Taylor was five years old, and he was taught... What was he taught? He was taught to leave matches and lighters alone. And he learned early in life, Taylor, never play with matches. Use a dialogue. We want to hear what he heard. And he should know this, right? But what happened? He, he went didn't home. play with matches and lighters. All right. He but he was something combustible. Playfully, he threw a sock in the, and oh, that's cool. What he didn't realize was that light bulb like the sock fibers. Before long, the house began to smoke. How did mom know it was, uh, was fire was going? Did, she, did, did mom hear flames upstairs? What did mom see, hear, taste, or smell? I just smelled something starting to burn, and I know that smell. Okay. So I needed to find it. And mom yes. Yes. smelled yes. smoke. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now what? What am I doing here? I, I, I'm also doing what? I'm trying to find the source of the smoke. But you bring us to the scene, and mom, smell smoke. The kids, do you feel a difference there? So you want to give us the experience, because you were so calm, you were telling the story. That's why Lou Hector says, don't just tell us, take us there. So go back to the scene. So the fire happens here, mom is here, eventually we talk to the, to the fire departments over here, and what happened to Taylor? He's now, he's now how, how old is he now? He's now? 29. 29, and he wants to know the and. 29, and he's? And he's an engineer, he's successful, he's not a pyromaniac, and I will get married because I told her what I did, and she's like, oh, little pyros? And, like, <laughs> and there may be a way, you mentioned a study in Philadelphia, do you know who did the study? I'm trying to find 
find that out. It came out in their newsletter. And yeah. I don't know where the study came from. Every chance you get, dig as deep as you can, because the more detail you have in your re references, the greater your credibility becomes. Yeah. The more detail you have, quotation, same thing. Don't just kind of do a quote, do the quote. Look at, go online, go to Goodreads, um, the, the Quora, whatever, do, wherever you gotta go. And I always look for two or three different sources because some quotes throw up in three or four different ways. I try to find the most commonly used one and use it. But yeah, and the last part you said, 60, how many percent? 63. Of those who, give, 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 go stat again. Of the kids who are starting fires will continue if they don't have effective intervention, which includes fire education, mental health sometimes, social services. It's a village. And you are so thankful that Taylor is not one of those 63%. Yeah. Close the loop on us. Make us very, very, we want to be absolutely sure he came through that. But we also want to, now we can see your passion for the topic and why it means so much to you. Was there a comment oh, here? Yes. We're just like, your topic is like, <laughs> <laughs> I want to quit right now. No, no, no. <laughs> Why would you want to quit? Because her topic is just like, <laughs> have you ever heard anybody speak on that? It's amazing. No, I have had a, I have a candidate who, who does uh, earthquake, uh, natural disaster prevention and, and preparation out in Canada. Jackie does that, but it does, you don't, don't think that, wow, your topic is so awesome, mine is so boring. Each of us, each of us, but see, she also speaks from a place of experience. That's why your story is important. We think, well, they're gonna, I'll tell that great story. I saw a guy come up to give it, oh, by the way, Kathy, thank you very much. Good, thank you. Thank you very much. I heard a speaker once give a talk about resilience and he mentioned a woman who had, had polio and she, she couldn't walk and eventually she beat it and she could be run and she began to run faster and before long she was in the Olympics winning a gold medal and in the 1960s her name is Wilma Rudolph. And when he was done speaking I thought to myself, I could have done that speech because I know absolutely nothing about him. His experience, his, what he has gone through. It's okay to tell other people's stories, but you want to include your own as well. You are, the, you, you are the message, not your voice. If I need a voice, I can ask a radio guy, like, Bill, can we do a voice for us? And be a... But they want you. They want the experience you bring to the table as well. And thank you for being brave enough to do this, Kathy. Who's next? Come on. Samantha. I can't whistle. Now you will share with us opening, ending, story. What do you got, what do you got uh, for us? It's a new opening. A new opening. Yeah. Guess what? You get to collaborate with Samantha on our new opening. How cool is that? Yeah. That is also one of the beauties of being in the NSA. You get to collaborate. One of my biggest ahas was sitting in a lunchroom at NSA convention back in, nine, in 19, I don't know, 2000, maybe 19 years ago. I'm sitting with Otis Williams Jr., Cincinnati, former world champion and, and NSA speaker and some guy named Les Brown. <laughs> and they're working on a new story, and I get to sit at a round table with these guys. Les Brown knows my name. What? So you can support each other and collaborate. So here's, and your, your topic, your material is what, your, your subject matter is what? Um, helping intense children with their challenging behavior. So here's Samantha's brand new opening for our speech. <laughs> Pause, two more beats. Let, let, the be let the applause die and make sure they're with you because some people are having a glass of water, putting their phone back down. You just, just, just take a look, make sure they're with you. See, silence, silence tells us to pay attention. It's the anti-dead air. It tells us to pay attention. One more time. Woo Where I would be spending the evening and head upstairs 
to say hello to the six residents who lived there ranging in age from 25 to 60. The first person I heard coming around the corner was Silent Laugh Larry. Now, Larry prided himself with being the eldest member of the household. He had a developmental disability as well as cerebral palsy, and so he had been in a wheelchair since he was a little boy. Larry comes around the corner and says, Hi, Samantha, how are you? I'm great, Larry. How are you today? Oh, just scratch my back. I've been sitting in this chair all day. He puts out his arm. I reach forward with my right arm, scratch his back with my left arm, and he goes, ah, that's better. Now was the moment that I had been preparing for all week. See, Larry had slapstick humor, and so he liked stories of injury or people getting hurt or in trouble, and I had the perfect story from this week. He said, Samantha, any good stories from the week? Yes. Pause for a second. Uh -huh. Larry looking down at you? No, right, Larry's looking up. Right? It's a, little, a little thing, but you gotta remember, you're, you're here, Larry's down. So, yeah. Any good stories this week? Larry, you will not believe what happened. On Wednesday, you know how I ride my bicycle from my apartment in Northeast Minneapolis to the University of Minnesota? Well, I was trying to beat a car to making a left hand turn. And I hit an oil seat, an oil seat, and boom! Bike went out from under me, feet still flipped into the pedals, and my head, which was wearing a helmet, was the first thing to hit the ground. Larry looks up at me, and in true to form, responds like this. <laughs> Pause. Pause. It's good. Mike, Mike, Mike is lying over here. Now, you can magnify that. Yeah. Don't tell us what he did. Show us. Yeah. And you could say, oh, it's like, and bam! Can, I, can you say face plant? Mm -hmm. <laughs> now we know Larry looked up and laughed silently. You silent laugh, Larry. Don't say, Larry looked up at me and did. Ah, yes. Let the action tell the story. Let the action tell the story. Because your audience is pretty intelligent. They'll get it. One thought for you, yes. you're a such a cheerful person. Mm -hmm. My concern is your facial expression should be congruent mm -hmm. with the message you give. So if it's a, it is not happy, not sad, if it's neutral, don't always be smiling about it. Mm -hmm. But if you're pensive, show what you're thinking about. I mean, they're passing your story, you don't need to be smiling as much. Yeah. It's a matter of fact. You know, I would have to, I leave, I, every day at exactly five to four, I drive up, I park, I'd go in to see these residents. The age was from, from, from what, 26 to 60? Mm -hmm. Very eclectic group. And I got to be with them every single day. And I always wanted to meet one person. <laughs> Silent laugh, Larry. But this guy was something else. Now the laugh comes out. Now we see the joy you have of meeting him. And we can divorce that, forgive the word divorce, but from the routine of going is not where the joy is. The joy is spending time with Silent Laugh Larry. So you see that the smile is bigger in that moment. And then when he both start laughing, the audience laughs, that gives you time. Let them laugh before you continue. Helpful? Yeah. Other ideas for her regarding her first story? Do you like it? Yeah. yeah. Does anyone think you need to get to the point of the story a little more quick? He's thinking that. I can almost tell. John goes, well, where's the story going? So what is the story supposed to get? What's the, what's the point you want to get to with the story? Yeah, so the point is I talk about Larry who's um, easy to come home to, and then I talk about another resident who's in a lot of pain. How do you bridge those two stories? I mean, those two um, depictions? Um, usually after I talk about Larry, I um, pose a question and give the audience a minute. So I say, ask something like, um, you know, Larry was easy to please, fun to come home to. You probably know somebody like that in your life. Take a minute and share it with the person next to you. Okay. Then when they come back, I talk about um, how I make the round, but end with um, Chuck, who has rheumatoid arthritis and in a lot of pain. And you're six residents in the house, you said? Six in the house. Do you go through all six? six? No, no. You only said two. Okay. I make the round, I end with Chuck all the time, and I'm like, I don't know where I'm at this point in the stage, but I'm like in the living room. Right, again, so you're thinking, you're, now you're thinking, how do I let the audience see the house? See what happens when you begin to really process this? You begin to think differently, and what I think is going to happen with this is you're going to end up painting a great picture. Yeah. So here's my instruction that I did not mention at all in the first half, but you've got to take care of this regarding your platform presentations. 
Maybe you were told it's important to rehearse in front of a mirror. Who was ever told that by show of hands? Have you, by show of hands, have you ever done that? Done the mirror rehearsal? Yes, great. That's passe. We're 21st century. Record yourself. Record yourself rehearsing. Trust me. But don't just record it. You gotta do something else. Watch it. But don't just watch it. You gotta, you gotta watch it three ways. One, watch it sound off. Why? You see the fig leaf? If you see, you see the ring twirl, see the ear, earring pull. Some women, I don't know why, but they'll t cross their legs, get a nice hip shape going. Okay? We laugh at that, but you watch yourself sound off. You will see how much you move. You will also see, is your facial expression congruent with the thought you're expressing? I, I can't tell you, I'm so thrilled I get a chance to speak today to NSA Minnesota. I have waited for the last three weeks to be here. I am thrilled beyond measure. Do you believe me? No. I'm not saying it. All right? At faith. Boom, I fell on the ground. Can you say face plant? Ouch. You believe that? Yes, because the face shows it. So watch it sound off. Second time around, rewind it. Volume, max, play it, but don't look at it. Listen to it. Am I pausing long enough? Am I, is my voice, pitch, level, speaking rate congruent with the characters? Can you tell the father from the son? Can you tell Samantha from Larry? And sometimes a small accent change. Again, I told you earlier, can you hear the differences? And if you record yourself with a live audience, is the audience responding as I thought they would? Are they laughing? Are they silent? Are they, are they responding? When you listen to a recording, especially live audience, you hear all of that. If at all possible, watch yourself fast forward. I don't know if you can or not. If it's a YouTube video, you put a button on the, on the, on the circle and just kind of scroll through, and you see the movement. My gosh, I'm like a little, stop. Now you're doing a TED talk, red circle, you really can't move too much. But are you standing still at a point where you could move? Where movement would help you? Is my prop there too long? Am I not using it properly? All those things come out. Watch it, no sound off. Uh, play it, don't watch, listen only. When you can, play fast forward. And then one more time, watch it normal speed with the knowledge you've just gained. All of a sudden, ah, oh, I can tweak that. I can change this. Um, is my volume right? Am I too strident? Am I too loud? Do I sound angry when I should be enthusiastic? Am I always on a high? Because some people have energy, and they start like a sledgehammer, and they end like a bulldozer. But nobody in this room. Just kidding. Just kidding, Liz. Is that, is, that, is that helpful to you? Do you see how that will work? So what is also one more thing I didn't tell you earlier. There is so much power in contrast. If you can contrast Larry with Chuck, Chuck if the audience can almost feel that contrast, they'll appreciate the, the importance and the power of what you do to be able to minister to this guy who's like this and this person who's not. Who's, who's not. And they see the impact of how you have to to work within the confines of so many different characters, it really is a powerful tool to show the contrast. Helpful? Yes. Applause for Samantha. <laughs> Don't. Sorry, last thing, if I may. Yes, please. <laughs> when I gave this keynote last month, his name was just Larry. No. So today it was silent laugh. <laughs> and now we know why. Excellent. One more. We have time for we have time for one more brave volunteer. Uh oh, wow, the boss says a guy must come up. Who's coming? Don't let Liz point to, hey, Tim's gonna come up. I knew it, I knew it, man. All right, Tim. Now, what will you share, Tim? A cop story or an opening or what do you got for us? Uh, a story toward the end of my presentation. Mm. And you talk about? I talk about rhythm of life, balance, harmony, oh, challenge, cool. and choices. All right, welcome, Tim. Choices, my friends, we all have choices. Each and every one of us can choose how we react to a situation. 
We don't, don't always have the choice in a situation, but we can choose our attitude. When I was a young correctional officer in Clay County, Moorhead, Minnesota, one of our choices that we had was to wear rubber gloves when we did our pat-down searches. But the gloves in the late 80s were thick, they had powder, and when I'd take them off, my hands were sweaty and I'd get the powder all over my pants. And so a lot of times I chose not to wear rubber gloves. And the Moorhead Police Department brought in a client <laughs> who got brought in, and the man was huge. A big guy who made a fashion choice in wearing bib overalls. Pause for a second. How big is big? <coughs> if I said they brought this guy 6'5", 3'10", I'm talking monster big. Can you see 6'5", 3'10", more than big? So specificity can be helpful. You want the audience to see. So big for somebody could be, you know, if you're five foot three, big could be five nine. Yeah. But if I say six five three ten, he could have been a linebacker for you. But just picture the image. So give us a client. They brought in this guest. <laughs> so the Murray Police Department brought in our new client, and he was huge. Six five, three hundred and ten pounds, wearing big overalls. I don't remember his name, but I think of Bubba. <laughs> I think of Bubba, and Bubba was really drunk, but Bubba was really happy. And I was happy that Bubba was happy. <laughs> and Bubba came in and put his hands on the counter, and I'm starting to go through his pockets with my gloveless hands. Big overalls have a lot of pockets. A lot of pockets. So I'm doing the Macarena. And I'm starting out with the pockets up here and pockets and pockets and pockets. And my friends, have you ever noticed on big overalls you've got the pocket here, a pocket here, and in between there's a flap? I swear it looks like a pocket. <laughs> I'm going through the pockets and I'm checking inventory, looking for drugs and contraband and weapons and taking out my... Pause, money. Tim. You set us up. We want to know about the pockets. I'm in there! You already told us the pockets, so now my brain is going, okay, we understand. You did the whole Macarena thing, okay? So get us there quicker, and now we want to get the reveal. So, yeah. I'm in the pockets, I'm going in, and I get it to the flap that I think is a pocket. And I go in, and Bubba made an important fashion choice that morning, in addition to wearing big overalls, Bubba chose to go commando. Perfect. That was the line I wanted to hear. Perfect. Go commando. Excellent. So I'm in there. <laughs> things I ought not be touching. Now, right there, you don't even need to say that. Once you go, I'm in there with my gloveless hands. What, what are you thinking now? Ooh. Is that a gun or are you glad to see me, right? So, so, so Jesse's dying here, right? You don't need to say it because they're thinking it. So let your face reinforce to them, yikes, I don't want to be here. You already said gloveless hand. So we're, we're with you on this, okay? So, so bring it home now, Tim. Bring it home now. And in my mind, I'm thinking, Neil Diamond, hands, touching hands, reaching out, touching me, touching you. My friends. Bubba made an important choice in his attitude at that moment. <laughs> he looked at me. Again, don't tell us he looked at you. Don't tell us. Be, 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 be Bubba. Bubba made an important choice in his attitude. <laughs> <laughs> and I choose to tell that story because I recognize it for what it was. Disgusting! <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> But what does that disgusting lead to? It was disgusting, but what? How you respond to it? Is, it, is it you're going with this? It's how we respond to situations? Challenges and choices. 
Excellent. Now, when Bubba uh, responds to you, he said, Bubba made an important choice that day. I would use the line first and then become Bubba because you're narrating. Bubba made an important choice that day. <laughs> now, you didn't see my face just now, okay? But let your face be Bubba's face. Let the laugh be kind of deeper. Because <laughs> he's a big guy. We're not thinking, we're not thinking um, stir crazy. Down in the valley, the valley so low. So crazy, Richard Pryor, the big fat guy. Never mind, I'm so... Okay. But when you become Bubba, say, he made a choice, then become him. Big part, we always know what this means. That's Bubba on the, on the, on the counter. When he goes... <laughs> Let the face become Bubba. Then you get out of character. And I would move then and say, you know, he made a choice that day in how to respond. As did I, but I knew what it felt like. Disgusting! But in our lives, we're gonna have disgusting things happen to us. The question is, how will you respond? Nice. See, see, see how that, okay, I'm out of the scene now, I'm up here, it's me and the audience talking. Subtle movement, but the scene was here, and we connect personally, now we're, now we're out of the scene. It's like, make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I cannot believe I cannot believe the time. My time is up. I was having so much fun. I had to ask you, has this been helpful today? I should not do this, but I want to say a special thank you to Samantha because she just said she applied in the moment an idea I left for you today. Do me a favor. I love the fact you have your table time and you collaborate and share ideas. Keep doing that. Whatever you may have picked up today, call a friend, an associate, share ideas. What did you learn? How can I use it? Collaborate. Help each other be better, not only what you deliver in terms of your content, but help each other be better on the platform. Help each other to, be, to master these simple skills and help each other continue, with my cheesy closing, continue to present like a pro. Thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you.